Well, I don't see any cars pulling into the lot uh, right now, so I think we've got everybody we're going to have for a little bit anyway. Glad you all could make it out here. And uh, good morning and welcome to Ashford Memorial Methodist Church in our 13th outdoor service. Uh, we have been doubly blessed uh, because this place is still just as green as can be, and it's never rained on us one time out here yet. So that is really good. You're uh, operating under uh, the guidance of our COVID-19 committee. We've got our masks. We're singing. Uh, we're going to maintain our six-foot social distancing, and if you're anywhere near a flag, then you're going to be 20 feet from another family, so all that's fine and safe. Big thanks, as always, to Dan Elder and the Oconee Well Drillers uh, for this wonderful green space. And it's green and, and it's mowed, and it's just perfect, so thank you. And the shade's getting bigger every week now. And thank you again for selecting our music, and finding those recordings for us of us singing as well as the choir. She also puts out the order of service. Hope you've been getting that email. Quinn keeps up with the other communications and our prayer list. And it looks like uh, the elder family is in charge of the video streaming again this week, so thank you for that. Well, let us begin with an invocation of prayer. Father of heaven and earth, send your Holy Spirit to unite our hearts in worship, in spirit and in truth. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, help us to uh, open our hearts and our minds, O oh God, for the filling of your word, to change our direction, to change our attitudes, to change our habits, to change our living, that all we do will bring joy in heaven and your glorious will to be done on earth. We're praying all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now if you'd reach for your phone or your printed out copy of our hymn for this Sunday, we're going to sing, uh, O Worship the King, and um, the verses will be 1, 2, and 5. So let us be standing as we sing along with uh, our recording.
remain standing for our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Please join with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And if you would also, if you are able to remain standing for the reading of our scripture lesson today, which comes to us from Matthew's Gospel account, chapter 25, I'll be reading you verses 31 through 40 of this particular parable. Jesus has been, over the last several weeks, giving us parables that indicate how we are to live during this time that we are waiting for his return, his second coming. Well, this particular parable talks about that day. So let us hear these words of Scripture. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from the another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. He will put the sheep on his right and the goat on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothes? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated as we prepare our hearts for prayer. find your list of prayer requests and keep that with you uh, throughout the week so that you might refer to these uh, as you have your personal devotions throughout this week. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, these parables of Jesus enlighten us, but uh, we still need the guidance of your Holy Spirit to help us understand the concept and apply his uh, primary point to each of our lives as we hear your holy word today give us insights to see and courage to change our own way that uh, our living may be in accordance with your divine direction and so we begin by lifting in prayer all on our list of concerns healing and wholeness for the broken and the ailing and for the lost they need your guidance, Father, as well as those who are despairing need new hope. And those who are suffering from 
the most recent disasters and accidents. They need a special compassion, as do the victims of all sorts of evil. And so we pray, O oh God, that our nation uh, will see you in a new light and will help in promoting the wholeness and the healing that is needed for our country instead of greater anger and division. These matters require more of your peaceful presence and less of our arrogant declaration. Open new avenues and venues to compassion, O Lord, and more opportunities for our humble expression. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. We called his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
thank you, choir. And thank you, Ann, for researching our archives so you can find another anthem that's right on target for us, as far as our scripture and our message today. Ministry of presence. Now, that's a chaplain's term, ministry of presence. All those years I was the command chaplain for the Air Force Reserve, each year, the individual units, we had 41 flying units, and the chaplains there would send in a report that gave some statistical results as to chaplain activity uh, during the past year. One of those categories was called Ministry of Presence. Now that was, shall we say, a measure of effort expended. What they had been doing to go and visit individual units and individual persons uh, out in uh, their wing. That was airmen that were working on the flight line or in the maintenance hangars. They were the security forces at the entry gates. Folks like clerks, equipment operators, med techs, motor pool, flight line operations, all these different airmen and NCOs. The most successful chaplains didn't sit around the office waiting for people with problems to come through the door. The most successful chaplains were the ones that went out to the work areas. In fact, wing commanders expected that of chaplains to be out visiting all of the different units because there they could build up more personal relationships with more airmen and NCOs. And therefore, they'd be more likely to have conversations uh, and talk about minor issues while they were still minor issues and keep some of them from developing into the larger problems. And like everyone else, reservists had their family problems, their financial problems, and so on. We like to refer to reservists as twice the citizen. That means they really, uh, they've got two bosses. They have their civilian boss where they're working in their occupation, their profession, and then they have the military one. And that can lead to some difficulties, some additional problems, whether with work or conflicts of of, of various kinds. And then there's always spiritual questions that need to be addressed. When I went out to visit units, and I went to see at least one every month in order to get around the command, I would go on their unit training weekend. And I'd just let the chaplain for that unit, one of them or all of them, take me where they would normally go, see who they would normally see. And it wouldn't take me long to figure out which chaplains had been out doing some visiting and, and, and were well known and some who were not. They kind of came through the area and folks responded to them like strangers. But it was my way to validate those statistics that they sent in, just to see just how real those might be. I not only met the squadron commanders, I would always meet with the wing commanders, get the command perspective, in other words, a gauge of the satisfaction level. Was the chaplain office meeting expectations or exceeding expectations, or was there some kind of personnel change that would be necessary? Four to one flying units, you can see it takes several years to make the rounds, but in doing that several times, I got pretty good at figuring out just which of those Statistics were fact and which were fiction, qualitatively as well as quantitatively. And that's what brings us to the scripture lesson we have for today from Matthew 25. I read you verses 31 to 40. I didn't read you the last half of the parable, six more verses for that. But this is another one of Jesus' stories, a longer story. The parable is the same about God's standard of judgment. Yes, this one has the length of the prodigal son or of a good Samaritan. It has great characters in it, so it could be uh, instantly recognized. And this is one of the more vivid parables of Jesus. And it is the only place where Jesus does acknowledge that he is the king. He's the king in this, in this parable. And of course, when Pilate asked him about being the king, he said, my kingdom is not of, of this world. But this is his only place to acknowledge that. But his standard of judgment is not going to depend on the knowledge we have 
amassed or the fame that we have acquired or the fortune that we have gained but it's going to be on the help that we have given that's going to be the measuring rod it's really our reaction to human need and it's measured by simple basic help that is offered and offered from the heart to those in need uh, food for the hungry thirsty get something to drink the stranger gets welcomed you cheer up the sick visit the prison efforts expended extended and not necessarily results achieved no 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 the business that we're in God does the heavy lifting and makes the changes to people's hearts no for us it is just to make the offer to reach out with the help first thing that we need to note here is that those kinds of efforts those kinds of things are hard it's hard to see the successes in that kind of a situation they may not be visible they're not recognizable by the doer we don't realize it. and so we like the sheep ask the question when do when did we do this for you Lord these are fruits of faith they go unnoticed similar to the fruits of the Spirit the Holy Spirit gives us gifts that enable us to do some things we couldn't otherwise do. And often those fruits, especially the gifts and then the fruits that follow, are more noticeable to other people in us than they are to ourselves. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, those kind of things. Eventually what they do is they lead to our fruits of faith. And those are recognized by our Lord the king, the king alone who can judge between the sheep and the goat. To help us with our context, remember parables have to be measured in their, in their context, and this is a part of a series of parables that uh, Jesus is weaving with several strands of teaching about the future. These are prophecies in Matthew, especially chapter 24 and chapter 25. And so like all the prophets of the Old Testament, Jesus gives, uh, he gives a prophecy to everybody that's there. Most of the stuff went to the disciples later on, but everybody there, he says that the, the Jerusalem, the temple is going to be destroyed. Now, the prophets were known for giving a prophecy that was not too far into the distant future because there needed to be people alive then that knew he said it back when. And so they tended to give one of those kind of prophecies and therefore when that's validated it will validate what they give that's even further out and over the horizon which is what jesus was doing yes and these the way that he went about it was to take advantage of the jewish mindset they just thought in terms of two ages there's the present age and the age to come and the present age uh well, that's the one that has all the trouble. That's the one that has all the broken. That's the one that has all the bad. And it's in such shape that it can only be mended by God's intervention. So throughout the whole Old Testament, that was the story. When things got so bad, God would intervene. And so Jesus was, was setting that up as well in his prophecy. He was talking about when he needs to come again. Remember, we talk about the gospel. The good news, that's Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose again, and Jesus will come again. That's the full gospel. And so he was identifying with that day of the Lord, the Old Testament prophecy, with his second coming. And of course, that includes the same kind of picture, the same kind of vision that are almost indescribable in human words. But we can still draw some great truths. They'll just emerge from those See, one of those is that God has not abandoned the world. God will not abandon the world. Wicked as it may be, God will still work with purpose, not to abandon, but for intervention, to intervene, to mend. 
So we need not let evil around us now discourage us because recreation and not just destruction, they are the real divine goals. Yes, judgment, but new creation, justice and mercy. That's the plan to bring us nearer to our Lord's desire for a new heaven and a new earth. So Jesus spun out these several end times parables so we'd know how to live during this interim time, what to do with our time. And when that time is finally coming to a conclusion, things will happen. In the interim, though, we are to what? Wait, watch, and work. That's the last three weeks' worth of parables right there. Building God's heavenly kingdom on earth. You see, that's what Christians are to be about during this time. There's not much support for Christians going hiding in a cave or in a bunker uh, with a lot of supplies to last for years. That's not the intention here. The intention of this parable is to tell us we need to be at work. In fact, we should have some fruits of faith that will testify for us once the Lord does return for the second time. So the fruits of faith, yes, they give us a context. This parable does. And one of the things is that we don't recognize when these fruits of faith are done. Thank goodness the Lord does recognize. The Lord will remember and the Lord will reward. That's what we're told. And that's what Jesus draws on from the Old Testament, like Proverbs 19. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. And he will reward them for what they have done. And then Jesus himself saying in Matthew 10, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me and the one who sent me. Anyone who gives a cup of cold water to these little ones as my disciples will not lose their reward. These fruits of faith, we won't lose the reward for those. Hebrews 6 verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget those who have helped his people. Hebrews 13, 2. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some have entertained angels without knowing them. Here again, fruits of faith, we don't recognize it as the doer, but the king recognizes them on, shall we say, judgment day, the day the king begins to separate out the pretenders and the unbelievers. You see, there aren't 50 shades of gray in Hebrew poetry. No, the pictures are always painted in black and white, so there'll be a contrast. There's sheep and there's goats, so there's a contrast, one on the right and one on the left. Positive doing, that, well, that carries the most weight. But even, if you can say this, doing wrong, while it's not good, it's not as bad as not doing anything. Sins of commission are not as bad as far as judgment is concerned as the sins of omission. That is the most damning thing of all. Deficient in activity, in act. That's fruitless faith. I didn't read the last half of the parable to you um, about the goats because as it says, they did not show kindness to the hungry or the thirsty or the strangers or the naked or the sick or the imprisoned. Now, of course, the goats also ask the question. They wonder, when did we not do these things, Lord, to the weakest and the least of these brothers and sisters? When did we not do these? Well, there is no fruit. They don't see the fruit, but the king doesn't see the fruit either. And so what happens, they're the ones that get cast out into outer darkness. And they'll be weeping and gnashing with teeth. Well, that's not exactly what it says in this parable. It said that at the end of last week's parable of the palace. But what it said in this one is, is the same thing. It means the same thing. And I know that we would not call this very good news. I mean, this part of the good news of the gospel sounds so hard. It sounds so 
scary. It even sounds kind of unloving. I don't speak of it very much in a, in a sermon. In fact, I don't spend much time preaching against evil or against the devil or about hell. There's just not enough time. 20 to 30 minutes for 52 Sundays, I don't, I don't have enough time to get into those areas. And here's why. The world testifies to those realities. I don't have to. 90, 95% of what you're going to see on TV, uh, the uh, newspapers, the internet, they're going to reflect, reflect the painfulness and the ugliness of this fallen world. The, uh, the evil, the work of Satan, the places that are already hell on earth. You know, I don't spend much time on that. If I do say anything at all, it'll just be to point out a few of the uh, fruits of decay. Fruits of the decay, moral decay, that are visible when you watch any of those media outlets. It's not hard to see. It's not new, but within the last 40 or 50 years, traditional good moral standards have gradually been rejected one at a time and more than that, and often identified as the root source of what's made things bad in our society. And religion has caught a lot of that over the years. In fact, that First Amendment makes a good subject to look at for a moment. You know, the freedom of religion, the freedom of the press, the freedom to assemble. Now, the press, they've been pretty good defenders of their First Amendment rights. I mean, they're always out there with their teeth. They don't let anybody get away with trying to chew on the freedom of the press. So they, they've been doing a really good job of that. Now, the freedom to assemble, that's kind of gone up and down over the decades because there's times in, in the life of the country where some of these things have been retarded and, and then you try to get back and uh, be able to assemble again. And of course, we have a first-hand situation now where our freedom to assemble is restricted considerably. But that has people worried, Americans worried. Even at a, at a, a subliminal level, because will this to some degree become a permanent constriction of the freedom to assemble? Why do you think there's been such a pushback against that in recent months? Something as simple as wearing a mask has become a symbol of some kind of pushing on something that people are resisting, like the, the, the restriction on assembly. Well, I think it's primarily because average Americans, and especially Christians, have seen what the country has done to the First Amendment right the freedom of worship, to look at the last four or five decades of how the freedom of religion has been completely turned upside down. No longer as clear as the scripture, or as clear as the Constitution says, Congress will make no law establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And now you try to go out and practice that religion in public. You try to acknowledge that religion in public, and they can cart you away or shout you down. You have no access. We have no access to the, the public marketplace of ideas. If you have a religious word to say, you're ostracized. You can't be, you can't be heard. It's public. Yes, you can do things in private, but not public. So what used to be the freedom of religion is now the freedom from religion. That's the law of the land. And people with this assembly and, and pushing back in these minute ways, but you wonder why it seems almost irrational. They know what has happened to the First Amendment as far as religion is concerned. 
They're afraid it's going to creep in to other areas. It will be prominent. I would say that's a, a marker of national decline where the country, particularly the courts and others in the country, have turned their backs on God. It's irrelevant. A Christian nation founded by Christians that no longer express their Christianity can't be influenced in the public square. These are seeds that have been sown, and, we're going, and we are reaping the whirlwind right now. This country, I don't have to get up here and talk about how many things individuals do to fall below the line and be in trouble. I don't have to even talk about the national disgrace of a free country choosing to turn its back on God. That's well known. The whole Old Testament, the whole New Testament, in the last 2,000 years of history simply say what happened. There's a decay. And there's where it started. The answer, the solution is still the same. Regardless of the situation in any country, the answer is always Jesus. Faith in Jesus Christ. When Nicodemus came to Jesus that night, wanted nobody to turn alive, he told him he had to be born again. Nicodemus wanted to know, how does that happen? Well, you have to repent and believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. But repent, that just means turn. Turn away from, turn back to, and believe in Jesus Christ. And what happens is that people get born again. And it's the born again Christians who have the fruits of faith. And when the fruits of faith begin to take hold, that's what turns a society around. That's what turns a nation around. That's what turns the world around. And helps us be nearer to God's heart. The fruits of faith. That's the context. That's the application. This particular parable just sizes it up nicely. Sheep and goats. Individual level, corporate level. We're all responsible on an individual level, we're doing good things with good motives, and so is the corporate level, the country, the government, especially the church. Sometimes we just set right out to, I'm going to make sure I do something good today, and that's great. That will not be forgotten. That will be a good thing that we've done. It might not rank as high as doing something just in response to the need from our heart. Because that's what happened. The fruits of faith reveal our heart and how it's changed. Yes, we can join together with others deliberately, like we do in the church, to help. And we can kind of do that anonymously so that we don't get individual credit for it. I mean, the folks that go up as a team and work at Acts to pass out the groceries, that's a good example. Or providing a meal for the homeless shelter, being a part of the family promise, homeless families get to stay at the church for, for 90 days. I like Global Samaritan because we all know one person in Africa. We may not know anybody else, but all of us know one person in Africa. So David, the young man, was sponsoring through that school. So that's wonderful. But you know, there's a whole lot of other kids in that school that don't know us and we don't know them. So that, that really counts. We're anonymous in that. And Global Samaritan is also providing what? The, <clears throat> the well and the water for that whole region. So the, the thirsty have something to drink. And, and that's an honor. We don't know them, they don't know us. It's all about helping someone with hunger, shelter, education, a fresh start in life. Those things, those efforts truly count, whether they're done by the government or they're done by the church or by us as individuals. Those last six verses, I didn't read them to you. It's, it, the problem with the goats is they have no fruits of faith. They have no fruits because they have no faith. And therefore, they don't even recognize the needy neighbor. The question of the lawyer was, who's my neighbor? Yes, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Heart. All your heart. This parable has changed the lives of, changed the lives of, unfolds 
numbers of folks. I'll tell you about different ones. 339 AD, a Roman soldier named Mark was also a Christian. And it was a cold winter. And the soldier saw a beggar who was just turning blue and shivering from the cold. He didn't have any money. So he took his soldier's cloak, worn and frayed, and he tore it in two. And he gave half of it to that beggar. And that night in the dream, he saw heavenly places with angels. And Jesus was in their midst. And Jesus was wearing half a Roman soldier's cloak. One of the angels asked, Master, why are you wearing that battered old cloak? Who gave it to you? And Jesus answered, My servant, Martin, gave it to me. Generosity in its simplest form, without calculating the result. What does it do? It brings joy to Jesus. Our fruits of faith bring joy to Jesus. In 372 AD, Martin became the Bishop of Tours. He'd retired from being in the Roman army and went into the ministry. Saint Martin of Tours, as he became known later on, is the person that we chaplain trace our ministry back into history. For it was Martin's chapelle, French for cloak, Martin's chapelle, that set him apart. A soldier of Rome, providing ministry of presence in the best sense of the term. Fruits that spring from faith and fruits that are found in the lives of born-again Christians, those are the ones that are seen by Christ the King right now and on that day of judgment, when he comes again. And so my friends, that really is the good news for this Sunday. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during these years of watching and waiting and working in your kingdom here and now, help us be led by your Holy Spirit in all we do, for we seek to be faithful followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you're able to stand, please stand for our benediction and the response. And now let us go forth with this good news into our community in the love of our Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Cicadas weren't quite so loud today <laughs> like they were last week. <laughs>